and welcome to the fifth episode of The Churn. Today, we'll have a conversation around values like liberalism, democracy, populism, post-COVID world, and how all these uh, ide ideas fit into the order that we are moving into. We have two very interesting and accomplished guests with us. We have Matthew Goodwin. Uh, he wrote this interesting book called uh, National Populism, a Revolt Against Liberal Democracy. Uh, Matt is an academic uh, too. And we have Michael Safi, an international correspondent with The Guardian. Michael has worked in India for three years and uh, I think our friendship goes uh, for quite some time when he had worked here and we used to have these long conversations at various cafes. Mm -hmm. So, um, Michael, you worked in India for three years. And uh, you've seen how the liberal elite, the grand liberal elite of India, really misread every communication that they had from the ground, in the, either in the wake of the general elections or in the wake of uh, state elections. Why do you think, in India particularly, the liberals failed to read ground realities as it was, and they continue to do so? Yeah, I mean, it was certainly... Um... A, a shock to me. I, I mean, I arrived in India in uh, the middle of 2016, and I feel that the shell shock among liberals. I mean, when you live in in Delhi, as you know, you know your kind of frontline exposure is to sort of Indians, India's liberals. Um, and there was um, a genuine sh the, the shell shock. They hadn't recovered from it from the election two years before, um, and there were many attempts to write off Narendra Modi um, over the three years that I was there. Um, and I, I wrapped up in the middle of 2019 after his absolutely um, dominating, commanding victory in that election. Um, it's, look, it's a very good question as to what they've missed um, because I, I have to say it was a mystery even, even to me, only because, excuse me, that's my, my cat. Um, it's, it's, it's a mystery even to me because I would go out on these uh, road shows, you know, I, I would follow... Um, uh, like a, a, an Amit Shah rally in Agra, for example. Um, and you would just see this extraordinary uh, passion for uh, Prime Minister Modi um, that I think even by, you know, a generous interpretation, um, you know, his, his first term was, again, we may disagree here, but it was, it was like, okay. It wasn't, you wouldn't say it was a kind of home run on, um, you know, it felt like there was almost this sort of disconnect between his performance, which I think, you know, like objectively was, was fine. It wasn't like extraordinary. There were many, many good programs. And India is a very tough country to govern at the federal level because it's just so big and vast and diverse. But then you'd get out onto the ground and there would, there would be this um, extraordinary passion for, for the brand that was Modi. For the, um, I mean, the sense that I got was he kind of, came to represent something to people. He, he, he managed to kind of master the art of, of messaging in the 21st century that um, has eluded virtually, you know, I mean, most other major leaders. He, he had come to kind of, um, he had tapped into something. And I mean, why, the, question is, the question of why liberals missed it is one that I've, um, thought about a lot. And, and honestly, I can't tell you, I mean, I can't come down to a strong answer for you because I think it's something we'll be thinking about for a long, long time because I, I'm not sure we know enough, especially from a country like India, which is just so vast. I mean, so complicated. Um, I, I mean, it, it's, the, it's the sort of question that in my job, I, I prefer to be asking. And so in fact, I, I turn around and, and ask, ask you, I mean, what do you think is the secret for um, his success in 2019 that that was missed by by Indian liberals. Am, am I allowed to ask questions? I, I'm I'm going to take my um, no no no. You <laughs> definitely can ask questions. It is as I said, it's a very freewheeling conversation. So in my opinion, because I've been on ground um, in the wake up to the elections, and I've been a part of a couple of campaigns as well, uh, liberals never visited the ground, even if they were to, for example, cover the hinterlands of India or. Uh, or, or cover the margins of India where most, the border states of India where mostly my work uh, uh, prevailed. Uh, they called up the corporate officers of a couple of newspapers there and had a chat with the editor who 
herself or himself was pretty uh, you know biased in their own opinion and they file stories uh, sitting in the as you said the elite cocoons of delhi thinking that that's the ground reality that india represents and mr modi with all his uh, political might that he has and the kind of work that he has done for more than four decades now has really has a pulse on ground and he he connects with people at an extraordinary level i mean uh, an uh, an urban metropolitan youth would connect with modi as much as uh, you know a dalit woman in a far flung corner of uh, bastar would for instance so i think i think that's where my assessment of things are uh, matt i would uh, come to you now uh, when- oh, well, i've just i've just been listening to to your reflections and and found them very interesting because yeah i on a i suppose on a more philosophical level i mean the question there that that was asked around the well, why why have liberals struggled with the populist movement which i think is is absolutely the question to ask right now because unless liberalism can find a way of renewing itself and repairing its relationship with voters then then we will likely have more polarization and in my mind you know i'm very influenced by the work of michael oakshot who talks about politics always having two different styles that there there is always a tension in most political systems between what he sort of calls the politics of pragmatism that is about transaction it's cost benefit analysis it's technocracy it's managerialism it's um it's the remain campaign in britain it's the hillary camp hillary clinton campaign in the united states it's basically about an appeal to your individual economic interest don't do this it will be bad for your household's finances it will be bad for the economy politics is transactional vote for me get this but on the other side is the 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 style of redemption and politics is about national salvation and politics is about saving the group from what they see as a as a wider threat and it's deeply emotional and it's almost quite primitive and it's quite tribal and it's it's an incredibly potent force when it's mobilized effectively and you know the argument is politics is always in this seesaw between the pragmatists on the one side and and those searching for redemption on the other and it's this tension that sometimes gives way so if you think about brexit you know the number one message being take back control from these distant technocrats that don't understand your life or the message of trump make america great again believe in the nation from these you know liberal distant managers that just want to you know they just say life is about gdp that is what life is about but of course as bobby kennedy reminded us in 1966 or 67 that you know there's a lot of things gdp doesn't measure right it doesn't measure courage it doesn't measure wisdom it doesn't measure passion it doesn't measure what makes life worth living the joy of a uh, uh, family and play and all of these things and i think that where liberalism has gone wrong and where liberals have gone wrong is that they're still talking in this very transactional dry pragmatic style of language um modi isn't performing in office trump is not doing what he said he would do he's not bringing the jobs back to the rust belt brexit isn't working because manufacturers are pulling out but then we misdiagnose why people voted for those movements in the first place which was to have voice to be at the table to have somebody however flawed they are to be in the corridors of power speaking on behalf of them and their group and so i think we need to try and reorientate our response to populism by stopping this kind of you know um money first managerialism first approach and start thinking about the really difficult questions which is well how can we there i say it how can we compromise how can we meet in the how can we meet in the middle how can we compromise on some of these issues and that's a much more difficult conversation to have mm. um it, it's it, it's really interesting to hear you say that uh, matt just because um it reminds me of um when i was in my first couple of months in uh, in india and um in november uh um 
Prime Minister Modi announced uh, his, his, his demonetization policy, which was basically um, a policy to say that uh, something like 86% of the value of Indian currency in circulation would be uh, void overnight um, and that people would, would go in and exchange it for new money. And, and the point was to, to sort of um, bring a vast amount of um, what was called black money, I mean, untaxed wealth, you know, onto the radars of banks and, and, and the tax authorities. Um, and this was, I mean, this was a, a huge thing. Um, and I remember within a few days, it was pretty clear that there were real problems with it. I mean, there was just not enough um, cash being printed. There were ATMs that were closed for too long. I mean, I myself didn't touch any cash for, for months. So we just couldn't get our hands on it. Um, but I remember after three or four, I mean, after it was three or four after, days after it was announced, uh, Modi gave a speech in Goa. Um, and he, he cried in front of this crowd and he said to them, um, I, I may be sort of butchering the quote, but he said, give me, give me 50 days and I'll give you the India of your dreams, he said to them. And for me, having grown up in, in, in you know, the shadow of these very technocratic governments that you've talked about, ones that measure success in, in GDP and so on, uh, to see a leader exhort a crowd and say, basically, we're going to suffer together. Like, this is going to be hard but you and I are going to go through something and we're going to come out of it better. I remember watching it thinking, I mean, what is this? Like uh, in my lifetime, I mean, I'm 31. So I sort of came of age in the real, um, you know, the sort of peak of these technocratic governments. I just thought, I mean, this was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Um, and it worked. I mean, he, he, he came out of demonetization, which, you know, by, by most objective measures was a disaster. He, he came out of it more popular than ever. And, and I think you've really put the finger on, on exactly why. I mean, he sort of appealed to something bigger in people. And, and I remember at the time, Theresa May was the prime minister of the UK. And, um, you know, nobody in the UK, as soon as it had been won, it felt to me that none of the leaders would were kind of um, being upfront with the, with, with the UK and saying, look, this is going to be hard. Like, this is going, we're going to take a hit in the short term. You know, it was this attempt to say, it's going to be a success. We're going to come out of it stronger. And none of the numbers um, measure up to that. I mean, there's no, there's no way you can look at the kind of um, budget estimates um, of, of the first years after Brexit and say the UK is going to be stronger. It's not. It's going to be weaker. But no one thought to tell the British people, we'll come out of this at the end of it something larger on the kind of soul level rather than on the budget level. I mean, it was really interesting to see um, the contrast between the messages Theresa May was pushing at the time, which was like, we're all going to win, it's all going to be fine. And then the message that Modi was, was pushing, which was, this is going to be tough, but we're going to come out of it um, independent and strong. And it, and I think you've really put the finger on, I guess, the difference between those two approaches. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, I'm really learning a lot from this conversation. And I, I enjoy listening to, you know, the examples that you point to there in in India and that emotional bond that certain leaders can have with with their followers and this is what makes me interested as well in what will happen in November because we can sort of see the emotional bond in American politics going across to the other side now where we've seen you know Biden and uh, the Black Lives Matter protests and and now the sort of campaign become highly emotional whereas I think six months ago, as you point out, uh, rightly, that if you looked at the polls, well, actually Trump was quite strong because Biden or the Democrats didn't really have that emotional connection. It was still very dry, it was technocratic, and, and Trump was, was, you know, he was gliding. He had a good, good ratings on the economy and, and, you know, had the longest, one of the longest bull markets in US history. Um, and, then, and then now I think that emotional element has, has gone over to the other side. And, it may just be that where we are in our phase of political development, it, it may be that, you know, we are going through this redemptive phase where this is going to see a sort of reassertion of group politics rather than, than individualism, because we are humans. We crave interaction. That's why we struggled with lockdown. And when a lot of that is stripped out of, um, from, from us, we, we, we become incredibly 
um, unhappy and depressed. And, and there's something that populists are very good at doing, as you say. And I've seen similar scenes in Europe as the one you just described with Modi. I remember watching the Austrian populists campaign in, um, in a nightclub. You know, they would go to nightclubs to campaign during political rallies. I'd never seen anything like it. I was doing my undergraduate degree at the time. And I thought, well, imagine, you know, um, Boris Johnson going into Ministry of Sound and passing out leaflets and doing a sort of campaign. It just, it just made no sense to me. But in that particular context at that particular time, you just had the populists that seemed to be much more dynamic, in-touch campaigners. And I think to go to your earlier point about, you know, some people are on the street and some people are not. And I think that, again, speaks to this point that, well, if you are, I don't want to say liberal elite, but if you're part of that Metropolitan Labour Party or you're a Remain campaigner or you're a Democrat, you've got to get back in the trenches. Yeah. Mm. Michael, I would uh, want to uh, discuss something which happened very recently. James Bennett, the opinions editor of New York Times, had to resign after a barrage of criticism landed upon him for publishing a piece by a U.S. senator who called for a military action against civic unrest. Um, but the same New York Times had no issue publishing an opinion piece by a Talibani terrorist who killed many Americans. So this kind of liberal fascism, which exists to really put a roadblock on any democratic um, discourse, you may or may not like a person's views. But to put an end to all kinds of discussion, to put an end to any discourse by calling it populist or putting a moral tag on it and saying that this is right or this is wrong, where do you think it is leading us? You know that this, this, this kind of uh, you know, um, barricading of ideas happens in the Indian media a lot. And you know the credibility of Indian media among the general population of the country. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that was a... Um... Yeah, it was, a, it was a, an extraordinary um, episode, the New York Times. I think, I think no newspaper wants to be uh, the news, for, for especially for days and on end. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure everyone involved in that was, was pretty unhappy about it. Um, I, I, I guess, to sort of just think through it out loud, um, you know, if you ask me, the, 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 they probably shouldn't have run that um, the, the Tom Cotton opinion uh, piece just because, it, I mean, if it was if it was me, I'd have reported it as a news story that one of um, Donald Trump's courtiers, one of the, um, the people he kind of listens to, is pushing um, this policy that that is quite radical in an American um, context. It would have made more sense for the journalists themselves to, to report that he was saying that, perhaps present what he was saying fairly, but actually put some context in there. I mean, explain to people. Um, you know what? What actually he was? Um, uh, you know what he was? What he was um, arguing for? And I, I suppose I'd make a distinction between that and um, the, the the Taliban uh, piece they ran, uh, only because I feel that the um, I mean the Taliban's obviously a reprehensible organisation. You don't only run opinion pieces from groups that you agree with or groups that are sort of worthy of respect. I think you run the opinions that you think society needs to hear. And, you know, while the U.S. is engaging in negotiations with the Taliban, it makes sense to say, OK, we're sitting down at the table with these people. We've deemed they're worthy of negotiating with. So, you know, let's hear what they have to say. I mean, that I, I, I kind of I understand. But to touch on the kind of broader point you make, you know, it does make me uncomfortable the way that uh, we decide that some views are not only um, reprehensible or... Uh, worthy of furious disagreement, but actually um, cannot be voiced. I mean, I think that's something that uh, doesn't sit comfortably um, with me. I think it's 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 illiberal. I mean, I think I, I, I wouldn't cite it as an example of a kind of liberal point of view. I think it comes from um, a, a left wing challenge to to liberalism. The New, the New York Times made the point that you know for them it's not just a debating parlor that a uh, an opinion like that. Um, actively endangers them, um, and I think that's something that that ought to be um, ought to be listened to. I mean, that's that's something. Uh, I'm not saying you make a decision purely um, based on someone saying, "Hey, I think this makes me feel endangered," but it's something you have to listen to and 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 consider. Um, and, and it's sort of a difficult question for newspapers to grapple with. And it was the New York Times that made the point this week that 
we're living in times that really challenge this liberal idea that, you know, you have this like um, debate out there and people may have discussions and you decide who wins because in the form of someone like Donald Trump and his administration, um, they're voicing, you know, extreme opinions, opinions that are radical um, and where you could make the argument that you know, not everything, some many of the things Trump and those around him say are insightful, are, are dangerous, and so they shouldn't be uh, just treated like uh, another argument. And, you know, that's, that, that says a bigger thing about the place that the US is in, is in now. But I'd be interested in hearing both of your views on that opinion piece and whether it's I, I, I sort of disagree with uh, with you the point that you made about um, the fact that you know it's, it was okay to have a Taliban leader present an opinion because uh, he should get some platform to sort of explain what's going on but um, the piece that US senator sort of sent should be published as news precisely because I feel that in uh, that a media organization is not a political party if they are they should come out in the open contest elections since they are uh, they are that you know that missing link between people and their opinions with the larger audience in mind i think uh, there should be no bar on any kind of opinion being heard because opinions uh, might be uncomfortable but they are opinions and they need to be engaged with however however problematic uh, a position is i think it should be out there in the public domain also because uh, as you said that you know there are voters out there who uh, sort of get swayed by a rhetoric and vote for or against a political party. So why not have a comprehensive discussion around an issue with an open mind? Um, the question which really, uh, which really intrigues me um, in this entire conversation is also the play of um, social media. And um, Twitter and Facebook and all of these uh, organizations have been under a lot of uh, uh, controversies. They've come out and openly shared their political inclination. I think that's fine. But when you start taking corporate offices to propel an agenda without really making it clear at the beginning, I think it becomes a problem. Because who becomes a gatekeeper of what kind of morality should society really adhere to? Who made Twitter and, or Facebook, or for that matter, any organization, uh, which came prima facie to facilitate discussion, take over this role of a, you know, of a mini nanny state, uh, which can sort of censor views and, um, uh, and, and, and deem one fit over the other. Matt, your opinions? Um, I think the only way that we're going to be able to get through this sort of era of polarization is by upholding that marketplace of ideas and that means we're going to have to um, preserve and protect a lot of ideas that some people may find distasteful but they are essential uh, uh, to um, you know, the mainstream blood of society and what makes what has made me nervous over the last few years in particular, not only within media, but also other institutions within society has been this tendency to shut down and marginalize people who do not conform to the dominant, uh, the dominant view. I, in a way, I wasn't that surprised by the New York Times because, you know, the New York Times is what the New York Times is. I mean, I, I think it, you know, it's it struggled to preserve and protect the marketplace of ideas for, for quite a long time. Um, but but it's not just in the New York Times that we're seeing this. You know, we, we have seen it in a number of other publications and we've seen, we've seen in my sector, in higher education, a number of people effectively be chased off university campuses because they are holding views that people view to be un, unorthodox, um, not even extreme, but just simply conservative. And um, that's deeply problematic, it's simply for one reason being that if we want to develop the critical thinkers of the future, you're not really going to develop those critical thinkers by exposing them to an ideologically homogenous institution. I mean, it's just not what we want to be doing. And I personally, the, the thing I found most disturbing in politics over the last few years um, and the sort of post 2016 revolt sort of phase is I thought we were past all of this. You know, I, I think I was naive, but I, I thought we'd move. Some of these things were just not going to be contested, that we'd have a vibrant, diverse, heterodox media, that we would accept that there would be radical and extreme views, and we would 
um, provide a rebuttal to them, that our university students would be exposed to a multitude of different ideological perspectives. I just assumed naively that, that, that we'd sort of, you know, I say we as in, you know, um, sort of post-enlightenment people, that we'd won those battles. But we haven't, and we now seem to be retreating almost hour by hour, uh, given the events of the last two weeks, in terms of, you know, that now I wake up this morning and it's the removal of Gone with the Wind, which is now deemed to be problematic because of its association with uh, plantations. Um, and then yesterday it was the decision by a university here in England to uh, remove, to rename one of its lecture theatres because it had been named after William Gladstone. William Gladstone, whose father had been linked to the slave trade. William Gladstone was also the person who presided over the introduction of the secret ballot, who presided over the protection of trade unions, who sought to end land oppression, and who did more for the working classes than most people in his time, but is now considered to be cancelled, simply because of his loose association with um, the slave trade through his family. And so what we're doing is we're sort of stripping out all context, all perspective, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, in a way that is somewhat similar to the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, and we are laying the seeds, I fear, uh, of a much bigger backlash, that it will come from conservatives who will be probably anxious right now that a lot of their cultural... Um, uh, symbols and traditions you know we've had Winston Churchill be vandalized in Parliament Square we've we've had the cenotaph which is a very culturally important um, symbol in in the heart of Westminster which sort of remembers a sacrifice of our grandparents and great-grandparents um, if we're not careful we're going to overreach from the initial grievance which is an entirely legitimate grievance which is about reforming police into something else entirely which i worry will spark another backlash and quite a strong one if we're not careful i guess i'd be interested to ask you um Shabrasta, like someone like winston churchill um you know when you were, if you were to walk past his statue in um in in london i mean what feelings would that throw up for you and what would you in the context of this debate believe should be done with a statue like that one? I would prefer that, uh, uh, you know, organizations like uh, The Guardian publish a piece of mine uh, reflecting the emotions that I have while I uh, walk down the road seeing that statue. However, having said that, that does not take away the uh, cultural association, the political association or the socio socio cultural association that uh, people have with Winston Churchill. I wouldn't want to censor that at all. Uh, and that goes on for any historical figure, however controversial. I mean, uh, in India, there are so many historical figures who are in the thick of controversies. The, the very utterance of those names, uh, you know, makes the liberals cringe. But I think as, uh, as a true liberal with a, with a small L, not the capital L, I would want uh, multiple shades of opinions. And uh, I would want, as, as uh, Matt said, I would want it to be contested at um, the marketplace of ideas. And uh, in democracy, uh, let the best idea win at the end of the day. In that case, something like, and I don't mean to kind of throw a gotcha here, but like something like the Babri Masjid. I mean, that was torn down in a similar way to that we saw the Edward Colston um, statue torn down um do, do you believe that i mean should, should that have been handled i mean w would there have been better ways to have handled um a monument like that one to someone who, who many um hindus believe was a kind of um you know was built on on the foundations of, of a hindu temple well uh michael what better way would we have uh uh, would uh, you know India would have uh, uh, taken course too? We waited for the courts to give a judgment. We never allowed any uh, you know external organization to sort of take over the construction of Ram uh, Ram Mandir. However, uh, potent political opinions were in favor of that. I come from uh, from a land from where you know Ram's uh, wife comes from. Sita, it's believed that you know she was born in Mithila and was later married into a place I have been married to, which is uh, Ayodhya. So Ram is not just uh, you know a, 
a, a cultural figure for us. Ram represents India's true soul. When the concept of Ram Rajya has been talked about by none other than Mahatma Gandhi, who is the greatest icon for non-violence and uh, uh, you know peaceful protests. So, to under also you know if you just look at the Indian Constitution, the the original Indian Constitution, you will find Ram Darbar, which is you know Ram sitting with his uh, disciples, imprinted on the pages of the Indian con Constitution. And this was right when you know uh, Indira, Ga sorry, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Ambedkar really had those debates and put the constitution together. So to look at the entire controversy around uh, Babri Masjid purely from the prism of a religious angle is what did lot of um, damage to the level of discourse which was around it. And I would, in fact, suggest uh, that if you read historical evidences around. Um, uh, you know, Ram Mandir and, and Babri Masjid for that matter, you would be able to put a context to it. Uh, Minakshi Jain uh, is, a, is a renowned historian. She just got Padma Shri uh, recently by the government of India. And she put together a very interesting perspective on why Ram Mandir should have been built. Uh, and she debunked the, the liberal left narrative that there was no Mandir inside. You know, recently I visited Ayodhya for one of the programs and I found that uh, Sita Rasoi, which is where Sita used to cook for you know the entire uh, uh, family has ref, uh, has uh, 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 cultural motives from the land where she comes from so this is not as i said this is not really about religion it is about a way of life it represents the soul um, of india yeah to, the only just, so, sorry yeah matt go ahead well i was just going to briefly say that perhaps one way in that particular case that we could have dealt with that statue which i i completely agree with you is is more problematic for you know fairly obvious reasons than other statues. But one way forward may have been to, because we are we are going to need a framework for dealing with these issues, right? If you accept that these issues are going to continually occur now, that we're in this era of symbolic politics, um, we're going to need a framework for dealing with them. So the London Mayor Sadiq Khan yesterday said that he's going to review all statues in London. Right, that there will be a commission that will be top down, you know, led by elites to decide which statues stay and which statues go. Surely a better way of managing this would be to do some kind of a local deliberation, like a local assembly of residents or city uh, residents who can decide for themselves what they would like to do in that particular locality. And if they decide that a particular symbol is inappropriate that we leave open the door for putting that symbol somewhere else for example in colston's case there could have been a decision to say this symbol has to go it no longer represents the people of bristol but perhaps what we will do is we will put it in a museum on the you know the history of british um you know the british connection with slavery etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're not denying our history we're certainly not making a, a decision unilaterally to depose you know of, or get rid of a statue and throw it in a river but we are actually saying well this no longer represents us we feel that this no longer represents our community but we accept you know it's like sitting with the family uh, over christmas dinner that there might be a relative or two that you know, you might not ordinarily choose to be a part of your family, but they're in your family and you have to accept that and you have to look them in the eye. And history sometimes is like that, that it ebbs and flows throughout us. And what makes me nervous about this moment of, of cleansing, cleansing our society in an almost millenarian religious way of saying, you know, we're going to wipe the slate clean, whether it's gone with the wind, whether it's television shows, whether it's anybody who prior to the 1960s voiced controversial views about same-sex relationships, in which case, you know, much of Britain's elite is gone, right, effectively. You know, there is no clear end to this discussion. There's no clear sort of end point unless we try and accept that we are all flawed as human beings. We all, you know, and, and history is the same. And I, I'm very nervous about where we are in this debate because it has no end point and there's no leadership and there's no framework for dealing with this stuff. So where does it end? How do we stop it? What's appropriate to get rid of and what isn't? Which building should we demolish? You know, it, 
So, um, Matt, in your book, you very uh, strongly argue for the decline of the liberal uh, world order. Where do you see the future of liberalism or nationalism lie in this context? I, I think obviously it's a it's a big question, and I think that um, when we go back to the beginning of this crisis, many of the initial claims that were made around the end of globalization or the end of liberalism, the end of economic liberalism, I think were quite sensationalist and, and unhelpful. Um, but it's certainly true that, you know, if we were to step back and look at the broader landscape, that, that liberalism has had, you know, a difficult um, two decades. You know, we had that brief moment of optimism after the end of the Cold War and, and the 1990s, which sort of feel like uh, they were you know, centuries ago. Um, but the 1990s seemed to sort of usher in this, this sense that you know, the liberal consensus, if you want to call it that, both social and economic, was now the dominant, the dominant framework. And since then, of course, we've seen a number of pretty significant defeats for liberalism, uh, which have culminated most recently with, with what we've seen in the United States, what we've seen in Europe. And, and also what we've seen further afield in, in Brazil and um, a sort of cementing, strengthening of, of autocratic uh, regimes. But I think even within that, one of the arguments that we certainly make in, in national populism is that I think we've seen, firstly, uh, the rise of a new issue agenda, particularly in Europe and North America, which has not been conducive for liberalism it's 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 reflected in a public concern over rapid social change um and also demographic change and uh that's that's been accompanied by um strong public concerns over um uh, a loss of group identity and a loss of um community and liberalism certainly critics would argue is, is, is often too focused on the individual um, and too dismissive of some of those group attachments, which, which people have clearly, I mean, the big message of the last two decades in my mind is, is that the, the people that still clearly cherish many of those, those group attachments. And I think when you put all of that together, where we are today with the crisis is that, you know, it's always difficult to guesstimate what will happen, but we are likely to see this crisis exacerbate many of the underlying trends that were already sort of pushing that liberal order into retreat. You know, we will see internal um, divides be acceler accelerated between the sort of professional middle classes and left behind workers. But I think we'll also see, um, you know, we saw borders go up very quickly. We saw people questioning you know, the Schengen area in the, in the European Union. We see um, big, a big discussion over China, which I know you're also having in India and, and others are having further afield. And it feels to me as though we are going to come out of this crisis with the nation state being cemented as still the primary unit of organization for uh, uh, our political uh, and, and human reality. And and that wasn't the game plan, if you go back to the 90s. The 90s had a very different game plan, which was power would go up, uh, not come down. Uh, and I think the whole debate that we're now having over nearshoring, breaking up supply side chains, removing our dependency on, on China, the continued um, support for populist movements, I think all points to this bigger, bigger... Um, a uh, point about the lingering uh, and still strong um, presence of the nation state. Michael, uh, do you agree with what uh, Matthew said or what would you want to add to this? Yeah, I mean, that was a very uh, sweeping um, and a very insightful um, answer. Uh, I guess I would say that um, I know from my own conversations with people who studied the, the um, international architecture that sprung up after the SARS crisis that was actually supposed to facilitate um, cooperation, information sharing, and, um, you know, exchange of things like um, equipment um, in the aftermath of a pandemic. I was talking to one of the people who was one of the real advisors um, around um, these treaties. 
And she said to me that um, the thing that shocked her most from the last few months was that the second there was a real threat, I mean, an actual pandemic, people just abandoned these treaties. Borders went up and it became the kind of law of the jungle that we saw in the early weeks of the pandemic where you had reports of, um, you know, American officers running onto tarmacs in Paris to try to requisition things like masks. You had fights over ventilators, even between American states. Um, and so it was interesting that in almost this kind of animal way, um, as soon as we really felt threatened, uh, our instinct was not to uh, come together as one world or to find a way to cooperate. It was to put the fence up. It was to try to protect our own patches, even down to the state level um, in the United States. So I think that was, um, I mean, that's kind of interesting to show you that when our backs against the wall, it was, it was the nation state and it was our home communities that we, we thought about uh, most. I mean, I'm from Australia and I know that there were even fights within Australian states over whether to allow people um, to, to cross borders. And it was, I mean, a, a big question. And I think it was quite shocking to Australians who at least have a strong sense of, you know, being one country, suddenly see Western Australia, for example, say, we don't want anyone from any other state to come through anymore. I think that was quite a shock to our consciousness, to our sense of, of being, um, you know, one, one country. On the question of, um, you know, what trends this will accelerate. I, I, I mean, it's such a huge, all-consuming, complex event that it's entirely possible that it does strengthen the populist currents uh, that we've seen um, pop up over the last few years. But then the, 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 the point that comes to mind for me is that um, two of the big populist governments that have been elected in the last four years, so the Trump administration and the government of uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, I mean, both of them have proved to be complete disasters. I mean, six months ago, Trump was thought to have a glide path to re-election. You wouldn't put money on him now. Um, if Bolsonaro survives till the next election, it will be a, a, a small miracle. Um, now, look, whether that changes the larger trends, I'm not sure. But the crisis has exposed at least two of these major populists as being... I mean, incompetent, unpopular, and having failed very drastically to, to get their hands around this crisis. So I would just make um, those points um, in response to what, was it, what I said, what I you know, think was a really interesting and sweeping answer from Matt. Um, thank you, Matt, and thank you, uh, Mike, for having this conversation. Thank you very much, and thanks for organizing the discussion. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, such an interesting uh, conversation. And Matt, I'm going to make sure I, uh, I read your book and Shubhra so we can talk about our disagreements, hopefully in a cafe in real life sometime soon. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>